So in today's discussion, we just uh, I'll just you know kind of uh, trigger down on the key areas that we would be exploring in our discussions, right? So let's think about it from this uh, perspective. So over here, uh, so in this particular module, right? So I will be talking about uh, five broad models, right? So the key models that I would like to cover over here are number one, two broad scorecards. So in this, uh, as a part of this module, we'll be talking about uh, kind of five broad models. Out of this, uh, first of all, you know, there would be two broad scorecard models. So I'll, I'll, I'll divide this entire set of five models into two parts. One is your BAU models. One is your BAU models. The other is your regulatory models. Right. Now the regulatory models I'll divide it into two parts. So one of them will be your capital models. So, I mean, though both of them broadly would be your capital models, but still, I'll just use the term capital models for the basically the Basel models. That's PD, LGD, EAD. Capital models. And then there would be the stress testing models. Other stress testing models. Right. So when I have the stress testing, when I have the capital models, I have the stress testing models. Right. So within the capital models, uh, there would be a few important. So you know, there are the, the three broad set of models. One is your uh, probability of default model that's your PD model the other is your LGD model the other is your EAD model Is your EAD model. So once a one a one I have is your PD model, the next is your LGD model, the next is your EAD model. So these are the three set of models that I have, which on which we would be on which would on which we would have a very key focus, right? So so basically these since these three are regulatory models, right? So when you when I talk about them, we also need to understand what how the regulations work. And then what I have over here is the BAU models. So the BAU models would be divided into two parts. One would be your underwriting models or as we call it are the origination models for so the behavior, the origination models versus versus what we have over here is the behavioral models. The behavioral models. So, for the underwriting models uh, to address this, <coughs> so you have two models over here. One is the origination model, or what we call the acquisition scorecards. Right. 
and the other the one that we have is the behavior scorecards the other that we have is the behavior scorecard right so basically um, so these are the two broad type of models that I have with me. Or so, so, so these are the five broad set of models that we are going to develop along with the stress testing models. The stress testing model, we'll talk about multiple factor models, right? So we'll talk about uh, some, some time series simulation, etc. So we'll come to that, right? So this is what the framework is. And in an attempt to do this, in an attempt to do this, these five models, what we'll try to understand or what we would try to explain ourselves is that how is it that a bank would cover its expected versus its unexpected losses? So how does the bank go on to cover its EL? plus its UL, that is its expected losses plus its unexpected losses. So how does the bank go about covering that part and how is it that the risk management and how is it that the risk management strategies are defined or are designed around this? How are the risk management strategies designed around this? <coughs> right. So this is precisely what our objective will be. To assess, to identify ways of capturing the expected and the unexpected losses and to have and to have uh, an understanding of the risk management strategy which is designed around this right. so before we move into the modeling part right or before we move into the quant side of things let's first understand that how is it that that these models are developed right so how is it that we go about developing these models So over here, uh, let's see, this is, Right, so, <clears throat> so over here, if you have a, so what we'll do is, let's plot the loss distribution of a bank on draft pen and paper, right? So on the x-axis, we would have the time variable. we would have the time variable and then uh, on this part we would have the loss frequencies so when i plot this uh, you know so when i plot this uh, loss versus time what i get to is the loss frequencies or what i get to is the loss distribution so let's plot the graph And when we plot this graph, this graph looks something like this. Right. So, or Yeah. 
again. <coughs> so the losses that are earned by the, uh, you know, that are earned by the bank. So peaks over here. So now if you have a look into this loss distribution, you will see that, that the loss peaks up at a lower value of the loss. Sorry, this is not time rather. Uh -huh. Not plotting the time. So this is the, uh, the loss series or the loss values and that's the loss frequencies. Okay, so over here, uh, the amount, so the point where the loss distribution peaks up, right, you see is at a lower portion of the loss series, right? So it peaks up at the lower portion of the loss series. However, as the value of the exposure increases, you see, that the frequencies are draining down. So what does this talk about, right? So what does this talk about the banks? Uh, so, what, so what does this talk about a bank's loss behavior? So it says that that losses of small magnitude are more frequent, right? So it says that losses of small magnitude small magnitudes are frequent right and it says that Losses of large magnitude are rare. The losses of large magnitude are rare. Are rare. However, however, <clears throat> these are more impactful. So, so, so these are less impactful uh, characteristics. So, so these are less impactful. these are less impactful right on the other hand these losses are more impactful and they are more severe as far as their impacts are concerned more these are of more severe impacts These are of more severe impacts, right? <clears throat> so therefore, one thing that we can clearly understand is that the way to manage these two kinds of losses or these, the risk associated or risks which lead to these kinds of losses would be different, right? Now, the question is that uh, where is this expected loss and how, where is this unexpected loss? So the expected loss that we generally have, because this is a skewed distribution, right? So the expected loss or the average loss that I have is shifted to this side. So this is where I'll have the year. So the question that comes out over here is that what is a skewed distribution? And why is it that for this kind of a skewed distribution, the average losses are more 
towards this upper side. The reason is that, so basically, you know, when we talk about distribution, we are essentially talking about nothing but frequency distributions, right? So the outcome, each possible outcome, mapped to its own frequency of occurrence. So if you have a look into this, let's say that I have a loss value. Right, so let x be the loss series and this be the frequency of each of the losses. So x starts with x1. So x1 is the outcome, is one of the loss values that occurs, right? Let's say it has occurred if one times, let's, this is 0.1 million losses. 0.1 million dollars of losses have happened some F1 number of times from a given portfolio. So similarly, X2, it also has a probability of F2. Right? This, what you will get is Xn. This is Fn. Right? So this is how, so this is what we call a simple frequency distribution. Now, when we plot this two graph, right? So, however, when we plot it, we do not really plot X and F over here. What we plot is X and the relative frequency distribution. So relative frequency distribution is capital N. So, what is capital N? Capital N is nothing but the sum of all the frequencies. So, this is the total number of outcomes or as we call the total number of possible outcomes. So that is submission Fi. Right. So, this is <coughs> your total number of observations. Now, the next part is Fi by capital N. So this point, this is a very important concept and this is going to be our friend and mentor for the next uh, four, five months because everything in risk, right, you know, we are talking about in terms of relative frequencies and distributions. So it is very important to understand the basic concept of a frequency distribution and it is absolutely important to know that, that when I'm talking about a distribution, I am not just talking about, uh, you know, a frequency outcome and its frequency, but what I am talking about is the frequency relative to the total number of possible outcomes, right? So over here, what we have is, so what we have is F1 by N. Right, so this is Fn by N. This is one. So So you have zero, you have X, you have the loss. So <clears throat> like this, so, so this is how this frequency distribution is, right? So basically what I say is that zero, so basically, you know, if, so if I look into this distribution that I have plotted, so you, what you will observe over here is that there is an asymmetry in terms of the concentration of value. So towards the tail end or the higher end, there is a lower concentration.
lower concentration, right? And over here, this part, there is a higher concentration. So there are, so there exists an heterogeneity in terms of the concentration of the observations, right? So most of the observations are concentrated towards the, you know, towards the lower end values. And there are, a, a, there is a set of asymmetric values lying towards the right hand side. So what you see is that, you know, the skewness or the asymmetry of the figures lie towards the right hand side. And hence, this is called a right skewed distribution. Now, when I talk about a right skewed distribution, you can see that that most of the values over here, representative values, are lower end values, right? Because the concentration is towards the low end values, and there are a sub, so there are certain some number of high end values, right? So, so that that's where, so that is where, you know your right hand side and your left hand side are different so your so towards the right hand side of the distribution you have very skewed huge values and whereas on the left hand side you have the small smaller values so over here what we have is uh, so this distribution is called a right skewed distribution because the skewness or the asymmetry is towards the right hand side. Now if you look into this skewness or the asymmetry, this asymmetry is caused by a handful of very large observations, right? Whereas majority of the observations are smaller. So therefore in this case what happens is if you have a couple of very large observations, right, then you end up, so then you end up having this thing. So what happens is you end up having, uh, <clears throat> so you end up having a mean which is biased towards the higher end values. Let's say, right, that I want to, now why is this so, like, so let's say you want to find out an average income, right, you take my income, you take uh, someone else's income and you suddenly take Ambani's income, right, um, Mr. Ambani's monthly income and you take the three and you average them. So suddenly you will see that the average value would tend to come towards Mr. Ambani's, would tend to the higher end values of the uh, series, right? So therefore, therefore, in a right skewed distribution or in a positive right skewed distribution, the mean is slightly biased upwards towards the higher end values. Hence, this mean is greater than the median, right? Or for man, for example, the for, or for instance, the mode of the distribution as well. So you will see that so the mode of the distribution is here, right? So where the maximum number of the observations peaks up. So the observation with the highest frequency is your mode. Now over here you see that as you, uh, but your average value or your expected losses are more than the, you know, your. Um, Modal values or for that matter, your median law values as well, for your median losses as well, right? So this is, so this is the reason why, you know, because, because losses, uh, because loss distributions exhibit this characteristic of a skewed distribution. Therefore, what we can say is that, yes, this is something which is very, uh, so, so this is where, you know, the, all these risk models come in, right? because you have these two types of losses to manage. Now, expected losses or you know, the small losses that I'm talking about, so these are losses which occur every now and then. So these are your portfolio losses. So these are the losses that we try to capture or these are the losses that we try to model to our risk management strategies, right? On the other hand, on the other hand, what we generally do is so so after the expected loss, right? We we have our variance from the expected loss, or what we call is the unexpected loss. So this is the part. So this is the part 
which we call as unexpected loss. So unexpected losses are losses, you know, which is, which does not really occur, you know, but uh, they have very low frequency of occurrences, but if they do occur, they can be the bank to a total crash, right? So every bank, and that is where, you know, so this is where all these capital accords have started coming into play. This is where all these, uh, this is where, you know, all these stress testing regulations have come into play to ensure that a bank is sufficiently and adequately capitalized. So all these accords are there in place in order to ensure that, that if a bank ends up with an unexpected loss, it must not crumble down under the pressure. So you must have sufficient capital along with it to ensure that, that even if an unexpected loss actually occurs in the economy, then you can, your banks have sufficient amount of capital to take that challenge. Right? So, so this is where the concept of your expected and your unexpected losses have, or this is where your expected and your unexpected losses come in together.